Good evening. I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of the JKMRC at the University of Queensland, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Welcome to Professor Deborah Terry, Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Queensland and members of the University Senior Management Group. Um, welcome to Emeritus Professor Albin Lynch, AO, who unfortunately can't be with us um, physically. Um, to Emeritus Professor Don McKee, former directors of the JKMRC, alumni, staff, and students of the JKMRC, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the JKMRC 50th anniversary ce celebration. I'm Professor Rick Valenta, Director of the Production Centres at the University of Queensland's Sustainable Minerals Institute. It's wonderful to finally be able to come together and mark half a century of the JK after the event was postponed last year due to COVID. One good thing that's come out of the COVID lockdowns is the rise of the Zoom meeting. And tonight we're able to have friends and partners of the JK joining us from the four corners of the globe. So a special welcome also to our online guests. Um, hopefully you can see me. The JKMRC is truly a story of innovation and industry partnership. And tonight you'll hear reflections from its founding father, Emeritus Professor Albin Lynch. Albin had hoped to be in person here, but unfortunately the current COVID restrictions on aged care facilities mean that Albin has had to pre-record his speech and is joining us online as a guest. We'll also hear from JK alumnus, former director and first director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute, Emeritus Professor Don McKee, and from alumna and current program leader of the separation group at JKMRC, Associate Professor Kim Rungi. The heart of the JK is and has always been its people. And tonight you'll also hear messages from students and staff, both past and present, on why the JKMRC is special to them. Of its many research partnerships, Amira is the longest and most enduring. Now, unfortunately, the current CEO, Jackie Coombs, is unable to join us in person, although she is on Zoom, and she has very kindly had 50 cupcakes delivered to us to mark this golden anniversary. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie, and the team at Amira. We'll be able to enjoy them shortly. So we're fortunate, very fortunate tonight to be joined by the University of Queensland's Vice Chancellor and President, Professor Deborah Terry, who will be speaking to us after the first of tonight's series of video messages. What makes the JK so great? It's people. And not just the researchers, staff and students who've been around here for the last 50 years, but also our admin staff and our technical staff who give us the time and space to do what we do so well. All of those people from the four corners of the globe have made the JK what it is today. It can represent the multiculturalism that actually you can find in the mining industry. I've been here for five years already, and I have met people from all the continents, from South America, from Africa, from Europe. I believe the early success uh, of the centre came down to the people, the place, the relationships, but also ensuring that the research added value to the mining industry. It deals with the real world. You're dealing with direct mining companies, direct clients, and you're spending time out on site. Within six months, just about everybody ends up being on a mine site. It's fantastic. my cue to get up. <laughs> Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting here tonight. 
we honour their elders and their continuing cultural and spiritual connection to this land as we walk together on the path to reconciliation. Now, thank you very much, uh, Rick, for your opening comments. Uh, can I acknowledge Emeritus Professor Alban Lynch, AO, who's obviously joining us online, Emeritus Professor Don McKee, UQ colleagues, distinguished guests, one and all. And it is wonderful to see so many familiar faces here tonight and to be joined by so many alumni, industry partners, supporters and JKMRC staff, both past and present. And a warm welcome to everyone joining us via Zoom. Tonight is a celebration of one of Queensland's great success stories. A story that, in my view, deserves attention and should be told more often. It's also an opportunity to reflect on more than 50 years of JKMRC's history and to consider what the future might hold. Last month, in his first major speech on higher education, Minister Alan Tudge argued that there is still insufficient collaboration between business, industry and higher education here in Australia on innovation projects. He challenged universities to play a bigger role and to collaborate with industry and government to translate research into breakthrough products, new businesses and bright ideas to grow our economy and to strengthen our society. But his call for greater collaboration is not new. I think we'd all agree it's been a familiar refrain from both sides of politics for many years. But I do agree that in Australia we need a more effective, joined up innovation ecosystem. To give him his due, the Minister did acknowledge the many fine examples of industry partnerships and commercialisation already underway, including at UQ. However, the fact that in 2021 we're still striving for greater collaboration and innovation makes it all the more remarkable that JKMRC was already doing this more than half a century ago. In a hot tin shed in an inner Brisbane suburb next to a disused silver mine, surrounded by scrub, and I have it on good authority, more than just the occasional snake, Dr Alban Lynch and his colleagues conceived of a new kind of partnership with the minerals industry. It would build on the successful Amira P9 project, a collaboration that began between the university and 13 Australian mining companies that had begun in 1962. And it would be predominantly funded by industry to tackle significant problems for industry using the efforts of postgraduate students working in operational mine sites. While the internationally recognised JKMRC that it has become is undoubtedly different 50 years on, those essential ingredients remain strong and unchanged. In the book commissioned for this anniversary, The Next Move, and I'm really looking forward to reading it, descriptions such as pioneering, daring, risky and bold appear often, and for very good reason. In so many respects, the JKMRC was ahead of its time. In its earliest years, the centre was quick to seize upon the potential of rapidly advancing computer technology for simulations, control systems and modelling research. It preceded the now well-known Cooperative Research Centre program, the CRC program, by more than two decades. The centre was also ahead of its time in terms of global engagement and the international student market, embracing the diversity and outlook that came from having a substantial proportion of staff and students from overseas. And notably, the centre was one of the early movers when it came to commercialising research. The establishment of JK Tech in 1985 was a seminal moment in its history. JK Tech then went on to become a critical vehicle transferring research breakthroughs and new technologies into commercialised opportunities. And there were many of them, including JK Simblast, JK Simmet Software, both of which have been sold worldwide. Given these and the many other achievements of JKMRC over the past 50 years, 
it is difficult to precisely define its vast contribution to the minerals industry, to the economy and to society. Its advances in technology and automation have almost certainly saved lives. And JK Tech's significant wide, worldwide sales are a testament to the quality, application and effectiveness of its products. A strong argument could be made that JKMRC's most important product has been its graduates, and we've already heard that in the video, its people, who have had a huge impact on the wider industry. And it's wonderful this evening that we'll have an opportunity to hear many, I know, positive reflections and happy memories from JK alumni. Their successes enhance our outstanding reputation as a university for mining and minerals research. And the recently released QS rankings ranked UQ third in the world for mineral and mining engineering. That is a great outcome, uh, with an employer rating of 99.1%. It doesn't get much better than that. In any case, I think the greatest legacy of the last 50 years is that JKMRC is well positioned to make globally significant contributions for the next 50 years. This is, this is only because of the seminal contributions of its staff and students. So they've, they've contributed, obviously, and we've talked about the staff, so it does come down to the people, both past and present, but particularly those early founders. Undoubtedly, JKMRC will become very different to those early pioneering days when, when, when we're looking at things like clean energy, reduced environmental footprint, social licence to operate. These issues are now the heart, at the heart of, of, of what JK does and what we do, but I'm very confident that the centre will still hold true to its original purpose of working collaboratively with industry and research partners and training the next generation of industry and community leaders. That's what it's always been about and I'm sure that's what it will continue to be about into the future. So to everyone who has made JKMRC the success story it is today, I sincerely say thank you very much and I hope everyone enjoys the evening. Thanks very much, Professor Terry. As Professor Terry said, there are many people who've contributed to the success story that's, that is the JKMRC, but there's one person whose vision, drive, and commitment conceived and built the JKMRC quite literally from the ground up. And I'm delighted to say we'll be hearing from Emeritus Professor Albin Lynch in just a moment. So the JKMRC has been a bit like a home to me. I, I've been interacting or working at this place over the last 30 years. Um, it's given me an amazing opportunity to um, work with some of the smartest people, um, working on real problems, um, working close to industry, and I feel really blessed for the opportunity. The most important memories I have from my time at JKMRC are those formed with my fellow um, PhD students and master's students. Um, they helped me go through a life of issues and a bunch of um, happy moments. My key experience was five and a half months of industrial flotation data collection at an important porphyry copper operation in the Philippines, uh, commencing August 1970. During the data collection, Dr Lynch visited the site, its suitability having been suggested by Bougainville Copper Limited and a Myra flotation project sponsor. I've known it as part of my life for almost 30 years. So I did my undergraduate training with some of the people at the JKMRC and I went away and did other things for a few years and I came back mostly because of family and I've stayed because there are a few very special people who at work make me laugh. I think Dr. Lynch made, as I said the other day, this software to work better than this hardware compared to that software in that company.
fun times with the students where we have lunches at the deck and when we organize the JK International Night. My best memories from JKMRC were to travel to Mexico with my colleagues and Grant, to work with Grant, Kim, and Malcolm, to cook with Alice Clark, and obviously the weather. Good evening everyone. Thank you for inviting me to make a few comments on a subject which is fairly well known to me. That topic is, of course, the early days of the Julius Kruchnit Mineral Research Centre. I want to begin by saying that good timing plays a big part in any successful endeavour. And while it was not so clear at the time, it is certainly true to say that the late 1950s was a good moment in history for the creation of an Australian research centre focused on mineral processing. The post-war economic boom was in full flight. <clears throat> Global demand for minerals was growing at an unprecedented rate and the search was on for new sources of supply. As a result, new ore bodies were being developed all around Australia and the existing ones were being pushed to produce far more than they'd been designed for. Driving all of this was a group of visionary senior industry executives to achieve their production targets, they were prepared to try new approaches. They were also prepared to work together to develop them. At the same time that, as this was going on, new technological revolution was unfolding. It meant that the digital computer and a range of remote sensing devices were moving into the mainstream of business use. It meant that the mathematical modelling of real-world processes was becoming possible thanks to the availability of rapid data processing. I was only dimly aware of these two global developments when in 1959 I was offered a position at the University of Queensland's newly established mineral research facility. The, the facility was in a tin shed located close to a disused silver mine in the suburb of Indrapilly, about five minutes from the university campus. While it was not very elaborate, it did have one great advantage. It was far enough away from the university to be unaffected by the many distractions which inevitably rise within any large institution. After a few years, it became clearer to me that there may be benefits in applying mathematical modelling and the new computer app capabilities to improve the operation of mineral processing circuits. So with the support of Professor Frank White, I proposed a project which had that goal in mind. It was submitted to the mining companies via a new established industry collaborative body known as the Australian Mining Industry Research Association, or AMIRA. The proposal found a receptive audience and became AMIRA's first project to receive widespread industry sponsorship. It came to be known as PNP9. Over the next few years, I brought a team of people together to work on the project. 
all of them outstanding individuals. The majority of the project work was done at the Mount Isa Lead Zinc, processing circuits. It was at Mount Isa and at the Indirapilly Mine over the course of the next five years that the team developed three essential skills which would eventually lead to the development of effective modelling of mineral processing circuits. These skills were, were first the ability to develop close relationship with industry practitioners, the ability to close conduct real world plant surveys which yielded reliable data and the ability to process that data using mathematical models to yield a predictive tool. A team which emerged from the first five years of P9 formed the foundation upon which was built the Julius Kritschnitt Mineral Research Centre or the JK Centre as it was mostly known. I want to mention just a few of the people from those early days. Of course there were many talented individuals who made up the team during the 1960s and many more have made big contributions since then. Now I won't try to mention everyone but I do want to speak about three of them. A huge contribution was made by a student from India who became a PhD student of mine in 1961. His name was Kedimati Chakrapani Rao, known to everyone just as Rao. Together we made our first trip to Mount Isa in late 1961 and began to look in detail at the grinding and hydrocycloning circuits in the lead zinc concentrator. MIM had recently replaced their rate classifiers with cyclones, but did not know how to operate them. So they set up a test rig. We quickly realised that modelling the cyclones was key to the success of the whole project. Rao worked on that rig for two years, collecting excellent data in addition to his sampling skills, he also had a very powerful analytical mind. I will remember Sunday afternoons at our home in the Gap in the early 1960s. While Barbara would be inside with numerous small children, Rao and I would sit outside and review and discuss the data he had collected and try and create a model which would explain it all. Eventually we succeeded in doing that and worked successful in setting up the first computer-based grinding control system using the cyclone model we had uh, developed. This work became one of the fundamental achievements on which the JK Centre was built. An equally big contribution was made by Bill Whiten. It is one thing to create a conceptual model of a physical process. It is quite another to make that model easy to use and able to handle all the masses of data which have to be processed through it. I met Bill in 1964 during one of my many visits to the University Computer Centre. He was a mathematician with an unusual ability 
to apply his mathematical knowledge to solving practical problems. I offered him a job in 1966. It turned out to be a very good move because Bill was able to take our modelling work and transform it into a, a computer program which could easily be used. Bill's work laid the foundations of the process plant simulation software, which drove the international reputation of the JK Centre. The third person I want to mention is Jim May. Jim was never an employee of the JK Centre or even of the University of Queensland, but he was essential to creating the foundation of mining company support, without which the JK Centre would never have developed the way it did. Jim came on the scene in 1968 he had just been appointed as the first full-time staff member of Amira. Jim worked wonders in building a strong coalition of mining companies who provided funding and, even more importantly, plant access so that we could conduct our sampling and optimization work. Looking back, 1968 was a big year for the JK Centre. Not only did Jim May start his work at Amira, four talented undergraduates joined the JK Centre as PhD students. They were Bill Johnson, Mal Lees, Peter Riles, Don McKee, all of them made very successful careers in the industry. Don was my successor at the JK Centre and he is here tonight to make his own observations on the history of the Centre. Thank you for listening to me. Please welcome Don McKee. Thanks so much to Albin and his daughter Susie for pre-recording his speech before the lockdown started. It's wonderful to hear their memories. Um, as Albin mentioned, Don McKee joined the JKMRC first as a PhD student, then returned as a researcher. He went on to become manager of JK Tech, director of the JKMRC, and was one of the champions for the establishment of the Sustainable Minerals Institute, which formally came into being in 2001 and included at that time the JKMRC, the Geology Research Centre, the BRC, the Centre for Water in the Mining Industry, and the Minerals Industry Safety and Health Centre. We'll be hearing from Don in just a moment. Uh, JKMRC is a great place to work because of people, I believe, because we've got people with uh, fantastic minds and good ideas, and it's a vibrant place because we always exchange ideas and discuss about new things that actually can help our mining industry. The JKMRC combines uh, industry impact with academic rigor in a way that I've never seen anywhere else uh, in the world and I can't imagine seeing anywhere else uh, in the world and it's just it's really invigorating to be this close uh, to the action here at the JKMRC. We work together in a multidisciplinary team um, to address um, industrial practical problems and that enables us to have an appreciation of where the challenges are and the opportunities to improve mining operations. When you walk into the JKMRC there's a wall and on that wall are 281 students. The JK is about the students. Each and every one of them has contributed through their work to shifting the dial of mineral processing in plants across the world. It's a fantastic legacy and it's one that I know will continue for another 50 years. Uh, 
good, <coughs> good evening, everybody. Uh, Professor Terry, uh, university guests, and JK people and friends. I want to start with a personal comment. Debbie, it's wonderful to see you back at the University of Queensland. I, I had a sneak preview of what Alvin was going to say. Uh, and it caused me to have to change some of my, some of the things I'm going to say a bit, but not too much. In fact, the Vice Chancellor gave a brilliant sort of overview summary of the JK Centre, how it's developed, some of the things it's done. The speech was very carefully crafted, Vice Chancellor. Um, I want to build a bit on what Alban said, and. Um, pick up on a couple of things which he didn't say. I agree a hundred percent when he talked about Jim May and Bill White and, and Rao and Amira. Absolutely true. But there were some others who were equally in the picture and I'd just like to briefly mention them. The first is Professor Frank White. Uh, <laughs> Without a doubt, and I want to mention two organisations who are central to the story. One, of course, is the university in ways that a lot of people won't understand, and the other is Mount Isa Mines Limited, and I still think of it as that, MIM Limited. It certainly was at the time of the story when this all first happened. Uh, Frank White, the university made an absolutely inspired choice when they appointed Frank White as the first professor of mining engineering, despite the fact he was a metallurgist, uh, in 1950. The department had first been created, established in 1949. What was behind it? Well, two or three of the senior mining people in Queensland, and the leader of that push was undoubtedly Julius Crutchnet, who was then the head of Mount Isa Mines. Uh, White, Frank White, who I did know, he, in fact, was responsible for getting me into this business. Uh, Frank White came from the industry. He started off as a metallurgist, but as a chemist in Gwalia in the gold fields of Western Australia in 1931. He then joined the British Colonial Service. Made an interesting change. Went to Fiji, was there during the war years and was responsible for the entire mining fabric, not the companies, but the overall structure within the government uh, um, in, of Fiji and its overseeing of its mining industry, which is dominantly, of course, a gold industry. Post-war, he was sent by the British to resurrect the tin mining industry in Malaya, as it was then, which, of course, had been destroyed. So White came to the university with remarkable backgrounds, no real academic background, but an incredible background of experience within the industry at different sorts of levels and different perspectives. White, Frank White, the great White Father, as he was often called, White brought a number of things which are critical to this story. The first thing is he understood industry he was comfortable talking to industry, so he engaged with them. The second thing he did, well, the second thing he did, of course, was acquire the university mine. Uh, now, the university mine in 1951 or two was, of course, derelict and so on. The story is well known of how that was um, rehabilitated. Uh, what's equally important to this story is that it provided space to build some tin sheds, as Alban said, where big style projects, large experimental setups could be based. Uh, the third thing White did, despite the fact he was, well, he became a mining engineer. I always saw Frank White, V Mining, V Met. In actual fact, the university gave him the degree of Bachelor of Mining Engineering. He never actually studied mining engineering, but it was obviously felt at the time, Professor of Mining better have a mining degree. So they gave him, they bestowed upon him a Bachelor of Mining Engineering. He had a remarkable uh, desire and drive to create research in his department. 
And he did it in mining engineering, in mineral processing, extractive metallurgy, and what we now call physical metal, what was called physical metallurgy or materials. He drove for that. And the fourth thing he did was employ Alban Lynch, which was a truly inspired move, as it turned out. Alban initially to work on uranium leaching, um, which actually was a project which didn't work. But that's another story. Um, White also was absolutely behind Alban's push with the first proposal for what became P9 to Amira. Who supported that strongly? None other, very senior mining industry people did. One of them very prominently was Jim Foots, who was in those days general manager of Mount Isa Mines Limited in Mount Isa. So there's the Mount Isa connection going through. Alban. Um, Everybody knows a lot of the story, the Alban Lynch story. Um, you listen to him talk about on Sunday afternoon sitting on out in his house in the Gap, haranguing a postgrad student called Rao. That defined Alban Lynch, utter, total, complete dedication to the task. Nobody should be surprised with that story. Absolutely quintessential Alban Lynch. And of course, things moved on from there in a very successful way. There are a couple of other things that people might not know of Alban or appreciate. I think one of the ones was, and he alluded to it, he placed incredible faith and responsibility on raw young postgraduate students. And he sent them everywhere. That was unusual. It was, in fact, probably almost revolutionary. So he had faith in youth. And years later, when I came to work for him, the other thing that really struck me was he gave his people space and the encouragement to get on and do it themselves. He was a master at saying, there's the opportunity, there's the challenge, you tackle it whether you know anything about it or not, because that's what good people should be able to do. So the legendary mineral processing figure had these other characteristics, which were, for the people who studied under him, who were employed under him, we just set a marvellous um, example of how to build something and develop people. That was Alban Lynch. I want to go back to Rao. Alban talked about Rao, undoubtedly his favourite student. I don't know how many students went through the JK in his time. Rao was undoubtedly the favourite. We all knew that. We still all know that. <laughs> um, Rao was important, not just because he did a lot of cyclone experiments where, of course, at Mount Isa, but he was the guinea pig for the Lynch model of sending students out into the field for months and months and months to, do, to uh, ex conduct experiments at a plant level and get good data. Now, Rao succeeded brilliantly. It certainly became the model for every other student in Lynch's time and certainly in my time as director that students would go out largely unsupervised. The supervision was provided by the companies and the plants where people worked and the mines. Uh, so Rao's legacy is twofold. Cyclone model, yes, but um, establishing this great approach of students going out into the field. Come back to the university. The university accepted a different sort of postgraduate student. A postgraduate student who didn't spend most of their time at the university, well, who didn't spend 99% of their time at the university in a university laboratory, but worked in the field and collected data there. That was a pretty radical thing, I suspect, at the time. 
the university gave Alban and supported the students to do this in a remarkable way. It gave Alban Lynch and what became the JK enormous freedom and scope to do those sorts of things. That was far-reaching uh, support by the university. It couldn't have happened unless the university and its senior people were behind it. Uh, the other thing I want to say about Alban, he always talks about the fact that the JK was built and prospered because it was 5, mi five k or 6k or whatever it is from the university. And that's true to a point. But in fact, he says a bit of that tongue-in-cheek. He was a master at engaging with the important people in the university, getting their support. So he knew the vice-chancellor, he knew the head of the financial side of the university, and by God did he know how to engage with them. So he was incredibly perceptive in the way in which he approached the university. Well, enough of that. He's talked about the successes and how things moved on, the work that was done uh, again in Mount Isa. Mount Isa was virtually the sole field site for P9 until the la latter part of the 60s when other companies became involved in this. It was Mount Isa, Mount Isa. Where did this lead to? Well, in Mount Isa's case, Mount Isa benefited hugely from the successes of Alman Lynch and his team. Um, largely in the case of what's beloved of all mining engineers and metallurgists, more tons through the plant. Clearly MIM was interested and impressed. I don't know the actual story, but the notion developed of MIM funding a research centre. Uh, things moved in the latter part. Alban talked about 1968 as being an important year for the J, for what became the JK. It certainly was. I suspect 1969 was equally important. It was in 1969 that a small committee of Mount Isa Mines people and university people, which essentially meant Alban Lynch, set out to map out the proposal for a research centre. Uh, it was submitted, the work, legend has it that Jim Foots was, who was behind this, one of his senior people said, this idea will never work, whereupon Foots apparently said, you've now got the job of writing the proposal and making it work. <laughs> and, and somewhere in there that's true. Um, just who the uh, unfortunate individual was, I do know but I won't mention. Um, late 1969 was the proposal. The Senate of the University approved it in February of 1970. Jim Foots, he was still Jim Foots, he was by now chairman of the board of MIM, wrote the letter to the university in early March saying essentially it's a goer and here are the financial terms which it wanted. Um, Jim Foots, of course, became Sir James Foots. He became the Chancellor of the University, a, a truly great man, and the University honours him with the J Sir James Foots building, which the Sustainable Minerals Institute occupies today. So, MIM, University of Queensland. I skip forward very briefly to this business of the University and its support. Uh, that's been a hallmark of the way the university has approached activities at the JK uh, over all its existence. It took risks. It accepted risks. JK was an enormous risk taker, but it was the university basically who accepted the risks and essentially underwrote the risks. I'll mention two that I remember vividly because I was involved in. One was the establishment of JK Tech in 1985 with the support of Amira and Jim May. Uh, that was a huge risk. The other one, perhaps even a bigger risk, was establishing an office in Chile where JK people would be based, not with mineral processing, but mining-related work, in 1985. Now, people's memories may not go back that far, but Chile in 1985 was not exactly a stable country. 
Pinochet was still well and truly in power. And JK thought the, f the only way we could really prosecute that work was to have an office there. That was proposed. MIM supported that because they were part of the governance structure of JK at the time, and so did the university. You know, that's real guts on the part of the university. And of course it worked, because good people went and put it in a place. So, um, you know, to today. There are, I started off thinking I wanted to mention special people. Uh, there are a lot of special people in the audience today who, who really do deserve mentions from the JK family. And some are in the audience, some are not. Uh, and you'll indulge me, I hope, if I mention some as being very special. And I'll start with where you wouldn't expect me to start. And these are the administrative people of the JK. Joan Richardson, Libby Hill, Jill Mann, Sharon Blundell, Debbie Gray as outstanding servants of the JK. In many ways, the heart of the place over all those years. The great people who were in the pilot plant and the workshop, two of them are here tonight, Doug Brown and Mick Kilmartin. I remember them so well. I still remember Mick. I still go and see him occasionally. Well, I can't get to see him anymore because the rules don't permit me to go down there. But. Um, <laughs> These people are so much at the heart of the place. Wonderful people, wonderful servants of the centre. Uh, two others, Barry Kelly, sitting next to Tim Napier Mum uh, in the back. Barry uh, was talked into becoming, or dobbed into becoming a member of what was called the JK Policy Committee sometime in the 80s, I suspect it was, Barry. Uh, and really he's never <laughs> left the place in one form or another. He's given enormous time, enormous energy to the JK and JK Tech for, well, 30 plus years. That's a fantastic achievement. And the other person, special one, I want to mention is my friend and colleague for over 35 years, uh, Tim Napier Munn. Uh, I will just say this, a tremendous amount of the success of the JK in the post-Lynch era, which really started in 1988, is due to Tim, uh, and he still contributes today. In ending, I just wish the JK continuing success. When I say the JK, it's been said over and over tonight, and that's right, it means the people of the centre. Uh, I think Debbie might have said that the mining industry is now very different from what it was in 1960. That's true in many ways, but in many ways it's not. Uh, the, there will always be a need in the mining industry for new technologies and skilled trained people. And that has, has been said numbers of times tonight, is what the JK is all about. And it's why it will continue to go on to great success. Thank you. Thanks very much, Don. So many people say you never actually leave the JKMRC, and there are many examples of students who've completed their studies, gone on to work in industry, and then come back as a researcher. Kim Rungi is one such story. She's now Associate Professor Kim Rungi and leader of the separation program at the JK, working closely with industry on a number of projects and training the next generation of mining and industry leaders. Before we hear from Kim, let's hear from some of our current students. JKMS is special because we are able to learn from all the great minds of mineral processing. All the history just makes everything even more special. There are a lot of people from a diverse background, uh, researchers who are really supportive, supportive and helpful for the students, um, makes JK a really special place. It brings some of the leading experts from around the world in mineral processing to collaborate all together. It's 
a very supportive environment, are providing a lot of resources. Provides for these students all the facilities and infrastructure to conduct research. Here develop a relevant research for the sustainable future of the industry. The JKMRC is special uh, because the research um, that is done here and has been done in the past is relevant and applicable to industry. I too acknowledge the traditional owners and their cust custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. I recognise their valuable contribution to Australian and global society. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to join you in wishing the JKMRC happy 50th birthday. As we look forward to many more, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my journey here and where I think the centre might look to go in the years ahead. I have the privilege to have had an association with the JKMRC for over 30 years. From being an undergraduate where I was lectured by Bill Whiten and went to Russia with Alban, to being a PhD supervised by Emmy Manlepig and JP Francides, then a junior researcher, then a senior one who had the privilege to work with the dynamic Dee Bradshaw, to now being a group leader pushed to the forefront by Alice Clark. You might say I've been through the JK Mill, so to speak. When putting this speech together, I've pondered on what makes the JK such a special place. I believe it boils down to the people it attracts, but also the opportunity it provides. I've had the opportunity to do my PhD test work at Red Dog in the wilds of Alaska. I got to develop a computer simulator this, that is still part of the, the JK product suite and sold worldwide. And I have gotten to collaborate with the sharpest minds, both within the JKMRC walls, as well as from other universities around the world. And probably what is most important, I've made friendships that will last a lifetime. As many of you have already said tonight, the JKMRC's success is founded on its close association with industry. By working hand in hand, we get to know the burning issues and can tailor our research programs accordingly. The mining concentrator has been our laboratory. Because of this foundation that was laid by those who set up the place, we now have a reputation which attracts the very best from all around the world. All this is done with the backing and support of the University of Queensland, a prestigious institution ranked in the top 50 in the world. Being part of a university, our work is governed by the need for academic rigour. It ensures that we keep abreast of the latest developments and perform our experiments to the highest standard. I believe this is another important factor in our success. I'm driven by the need to make a difference and to do the work that will make a difference to our industry. JKMSC has provided me and others with the opportunity to do that. As we move forward past this important milestone, I see a rosy picture. We are led by a management team headed by Neville Plint and Rick Valenta, who have embedded a collaborative, caring culture. They make the place somewhere people want to come to work and are inspired. We are using the lessons learnt from our forebears and building strong partnerships with mining companies. We are getting back on to site to do our experimental work and we have amassed a group of multidisciplinary researchers who are so talented that I have no doubt will continue to keep the JKMRC at the forefront of tackling and solving the problems facing the mining industry. To see evidence of this, we just need to look at our recent successes. We have established new multi-company collaborative research programs. 
we have established ourselves as a leading player in the ARC Centre of Excellence Beneficiation Program. We are moving into exciting areas of study such as dynamic simulation and smart use of big data. And we are looking to take advantage and accelerate adoption of emerging new technologies. Flotation chemistry is another new focus area. What I also see as exciting is we are starting to capitalise on our place within the Sustainable Mineral Institute, being involved in multi-centre research activities where we don't just optimise the mineral, processor, mineral processing concentrator in isolation, but also take into account geological, environmental and societal factors. Our co-location with BRC is breeding new relationships and opportunities. The inclusion of the high temperature group broadens our horizons. With the merging of JKMOC and JK Tech, there will be improved opportunities to commercial outputs, commercialise outputs of the research programs, and for researchers to gain benefit from their labours. Our research will also benefit from the insights that the JK Tech consultants can provide. In closing, I'd like to pay tribute to those that built the JKMRC, many of whom are celebrating with us tonight. Our leaders, researchers, support staff, and most importantly, the students whose hard work has made JKMRC a leading research centre in the eyes of the international mining community. I've loved our journey together and look forward to the next 50 years. Thank you. Well, that brings the formal part of the evening to an end. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And to our friends on Zoom, we'll leave you shortly. For those of you here at Customs House, please join us for drinks and canapes and, of course, the Amira cupcakes. <laughs> thank you to our speakers, Professor Terry, Albin, Don, and Kim. And thank you to everyone who's been part of the JKMRC story so far. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and the final thing to say is there are copies of the book to take away with you at the re registration desk on the way out. Thanks very much. Happy birthday, JKMRC. Happy birthday, JKMRC. Happy 50th anniversary, JKMRC. Happy anniversary, JKMRC. Happy birthday, JKMRC. Happy birthday, JKMRC. Happy birthday, JKMRC. Happy anniversary, JKMRC. Happy birthday, JKMRC. Happy birthday, JKMRC. Happy 50th anniversary for the JKMRC. Happy birthday, JKMRC. Happy birthday, JKMRC. Happy 50th anniversary, JKMRC. Happy 50th, JK. Happy birthday, JK. So, happy birthday to the JKMRC. Here's to another 50 years. <laughs>